everyone. I'm just going to give everyone another minute to join the room and then we'll start. Morning, everybody. It's just past 10 on my watch, so I think we can get the session started. My name is Carla. I'm a postdoc at SIAB and I'm going to be chairing the session today. It's session number three. And please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box as we go along. Um, but we will probably take those at the end of all the talks. And if there is time, we'll also take some live questions if there are any. And I just would like to mention that at the end of all the talks, please stay in the room for a few minutes before you go on tea break because there will be a poll to vote for the best presentation. So um, please stick around before leaving and I will remind you. And yes, let's start then with the first talk. And um, I will also introduce the speakers before each talk is, um, before each talk starts. And the first few talks are from our freshwater students. And there's a lot of names in these titles that I have not heard before. So I will leave the speakers to introduce their talks. But the first person we'll be hearing from today is Alyssa Kutsia, and she's an honors student. So let's go right ahead with that talk. Good day, I am Alyssa Kutsia and my presentation is on the freshwater snail diversity and abundance in historic Cystosomiasis distribution areas of the Limpopo province. Cystosomiasis is a tropical disease that is caused by Cystosoma species, that is a genus of parasitic flukes. This disease poses many health threats for humans in South Africa and can even lead to death. Freshwater snails are the most important intermediate hosts involved in the spread of this disease and includes, for example, the Bellinus and Bionfilaria genus. Some invasive snail species also occur in South Africa and can affect the distribution of the native snails and their on the distribution of this disease. Various abiotic factors can influence the distribution of freshwater snails, such, such as habitat and water quality. Unfortunately, not much research has been done on the current distribution of important freshwater snails. The, aims of, the aim of this study was to investigate the diversity and abundance of freshwater snails and to determine whether abiotic factors affect the diversity and abundance of these freshwater snails in the Limpopo province. Sampling of the freshwater snails took place at 16 different sites, including the dams, rivers and wetlands around the Balabala, Sanin and Luitrichat areas in the Limpopo province. Snails were sampled for a certain time, making use of a standard snail sampler and handpicked from vegetation, then placed in plastic containers with water from the habitat. In the laboratory, the snails were collected and identified. Water quality measure measurements were done in situ, and the water was also analysed for chemical nutrients. Statistical analysis was used to determine the snail diversity and to compare snail abundance and environmental parameters. When it came to the results, um, eight different taxa was found at the 16 different sampling sites. The most abundant species found was Radix natalensis. Two out of the eight taxa found act as intermediate host for the Cystosoma parasite and include Bellinus africanus and Bionfilaria perferari. Two invasive species were also found, known as Fusella acuta and Terebia granifera, but were in much lower abundance than the native snails. Primer V7 was used to create these diversity indices and to indicate the number of taxa as well as individuals sampled at each shot. On the figure to the left, you can see that the over overall diversity of snails was low, and the figure to the right shows that the number of individuals were also very low, except for site 2 and 12. The constraint and correspondence analysis plot was created to indicate the relationship between various sites, sales, chemical water variables and the habitat where they were found. This plot explains 43.38% of the variation with 27.40% on axis 1 and 15.98% on axis 2. Sites on the right and left of axis 1 differ because of difference in snail diversity. There were more snail species at the sites on the left than on the right, and this can be due to mining activities at sites 1, 2 and 3, causing high salts and infecting the pH at the sites. This could also be the reasons why the invasive species Fisal acuta was found here. This invasive species is known to be tolerant to pollutants and can survive harsh conditions. Many of the sites found on the left of axis 1 also had lots of algae and water lilies present, 
algae act as an important food source for the snails, and water lilies provide more habitat for snails to live on. Snail species will thus be more present at sites with this type of vegetation. Very little habitat was present at the sites on the right of Axis 1 in comparison to the left and below Axis 2. Sites on the left of Axis 1 and bottom of Axis 2 was also more associated with algae and stones, and algae tend to grow on stones, and stones also act as a place for snails to attach to, which explains why more species was found here. The sites on, on Axis 2 were separated because of surrounding activities. The sites above Axis 2 were more associated with rural agriculture and mining activities, and the sites below Axis 2 were more associated with rural activities. The sites above Axis 2 were related with higher phosphate levels, possibly, possibly due to the agriculture and industrial influences at these sites. Less snail species was found above this axis, possibly due to the highest phosphate levels found here. Floating vegetation was also present at the sites above Axis 2. Many water lilies were found here that act as important habitats for snails, suggesting why some species were still found here. Most of the snail species known to carry Bellagia were more commonly found at the sites of algae and floating vegetation present. Vegetation plays a role in the distribution by providing structure to the, for them to attach to and acting as a food source. Surrounding activities like agriculture influence also play a role in the distribution as they tend to be less tolerant to polluted waters. The aim of this study was to investigate the current distribution and abundance of freshwater snails in the Limpopo province and whether certain abiotic factors influence their diversity. This study showed that certain water quality variables influence the distribution and abundance of freshwater snail species. The pH and nutrients of water played a role in what snail species was found. The type of habitat is essential in determining the type of snail species found. Sites of algae, floating vegetation and stones present had a high number of snail, snail species present. Surrounding activities also played a big role in the distribution and where they were found. Sites with high levels of phosphate due to agriculture influence showed a lower number of snail species. Invasive snail species also impact the distribution of native snails, which can affect the health of humans due to the effect it has on the distribution of cystosomiasis. Therefore, habitat structure, water quality variables and surrounding activities all have a combined effect on the abundance and diversity of snail species. Thank you. Please feel free to ask me any questions. much to Alyssa for that talk. Our next talk will be another freshwater master student, Hanru Pearson. Um, so we'll go straight into that. Good day. I'm Hanru Pearson, a first year master student from the Northwest University. My supervisor is Dr. Lizanne Denacke, and today I will tell you more about my project on the role of the Riba granifera as an invasive in freshwater ecosystems of Southern Africa. Teribia granifera, a freshwater gastropod originally from Southeast Asia, has become invasive in North and South America as well as Africa. Teribia are pathogenetic, oviviparous, and can give birth to one juvenile every 12 hours. The snail was first reported in South Africa in 1999 and since became widespread in the subtropical rivers and estuaries in the eastern parts of southern Africa. It has also been reported in important conservation areas such as the Kruger National Park, Nduma Game Reserve and Isimangalisu Wetland Park. Teribia populations have been reported to reach densities of more than 10,000 individuals per square meters and are usually the dominant species in invaded habitats. This invader may indirectly limit energy transfers within food webs disrupting ecosystem function. Several studies have suggested that the establishment of the Rebia populations often results in decreased benthic biodiversity and has also been reported to replace native snails within invaded habitats. Furthermore, the Rebia is known to harbor diverse and prevalent species of trematodes in its native range, for example, the Asian lung fluke and oriental avian eye fluke. Trematodes play a vital role in the control of snail populations as parasitic castrators, but to date no parasite intermediate stage has been reported from Teribia in South Africa. The current distribution and densities of native and invasive freshwater snails 
have been underreported in the past years and Terebia need to be investigated as a potential parasitic host in South Africa. This project aims to investigate the current distribution and densities of freshwater snails, determine the impact of Terebia on community structures of diatoms and determine if Terebia and native snails act as hosts for trematodes. The project hypothesized that the presence of Terebia in an aquatic community will result in a decreased diatom diversity, disrupting community structure and functionality, and that Terebia granifera will act as a host for trematodes, which may be infecting birds and mammals in the region. My study objectives are to determine the current distribution of freshwater snails from the selected river sites and calculate the densities of all snails sampled, to sample, identify and count diatoms and describe the effects of Terebia on freshwater diatom community structures, and finally to investigate snails sampled as possible parasitic hosts using molecular and taxonomic analysis to identify parasitic species to the lowest possible taxonomic level. A total of 19 sites were surveyed. Sampling took place on the freshwater ecosystems from the north-eastern parts of South Africa at selected sites on the Pongolu River in northern KwaZulu-Natal, the Olifants River in the Kruger National Park and the Limpopo River system. Of the 19 sites sampled, only 14 of them had snails present during sampling. Overall, only four species of snails were sampled and the Ribia were the most dominant snail species at all sites sampled, except for the first site on the Limpopo River and the site on the Letaba River. Compared to historical records of snail species found in the Limpopo and Olifants rivers, it seems that at least five native snail species may have vanished from the system over time since 1967. Terebia density were highest during the 2020 survey on the Olifants River, with an average of 2,355 individuals per square meters, followed by that of the 2017 survey on the Pongolu River, with an average of 1,187 individuals per square meters. The first two sites on the Olifants River had much lower densities during the 2021 survey compared to that of the 2020 survey, possibly due to high flooding events, which was also previously reported to cause declines in Terebia populations. Of all four snail species screened for parasites, only melanoides were found to be infected. Molecular and taxonomic analysis indicated that melanoides from the Limpopo River act as the first intermediate host for the species of Centrocestes and the species of Haplorchus trematodes. Centrocestes and Haplorchus use fish as a second intermediate host and parasitizes fish-eating birds and mammals, including humans. The final steps will be to complete my statistics on the impacts of Terebia on community structures of diatoms and finish writing up my dissertation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, Andrew, and good luck for the rest of your master's. And we will now hear from another master's student, Martin LaRue, and he's telling us about trematode diversity. Over to him. Hello, my name is Martin LaRue. I'm a first year MSc student at the Northwest University, and my project is titled Hygienian Trematode Diversity in Vectors Transmitting Schizosomiasis Within Ecosystems in Southern Africa. I'm supervised by Professor Nico Smith and Dr. Lazan de Necker. Schizosomiasis, commonly known as Balazia, is a vector-borne neglected tropical disease that is caused by a trematode infection of the schizosoma genus and ranks as the second most widespread tropical disease in most sub-Saharan African nations. Schizosomiasis is estimated to infect 200 million people in sub-Saharan Africa and is roughly estimated to affect 40 million people in South Africa. The people most at risk of infection are rural communities without adequate access to clean treated water. Schizosomiasis is however mostly confined to the northern and eastern provinces of South Africa that have a subtropical to tropical climate as indicated by previous studies. 
The effect of changing environmental conditions due to climate change can have a negative effect on the treatment and management of this disease. Complications such as changes in ambient temperature, changes in precipitation and water flow can influence the geographical and behavioral conditions of the vector species. This can lead to the introduction of schizosomiasis into new areas. In previous studies conducted within South Africa during the 1970s, the distribution of schizosomiasis was estimated based on the presence of the vector species. Therefore, there is a lack of information regarding the true status of schizosomiasis in South Africa. Our hypothesis states that the geographic range of schizosomiasis causing tremetose and their associated vectors have expanded from their historic distribution. The aims of this study is to establish the geographical ranges of schizosomiasis causing tremetodes by assessing the current vector distribution and parasitic infection of these, these vectors. Secondly, to compare the current distribution to historic areas identified and establish if vectors have migrated to new geographical areas. These aims will be achieved by completing the following objectives. To investigate sites of historic importance and potential new sites. To compare the current distribution with the historic recorded ranges of distribution. And to perform water analysis and habitat assessment on selected sites to determine the contributing environmental factors and habitat suitability and to identify parasitic infections in vector species. Freshwater snails endemic to southern Africa was sampled from each of the 16 selected sites in the Lowfeld ecoregion of southern Africa. Each site was based on the accessibility and the presence of aquatic vegetation that function as a possible food source for freshwater snail species. Materials and methods include water quality parameters measured in situ and water samples collected for further nutrient analysis. Secondly, a qualitative habitat assessment was performed adapted from Vegrai. The least snails was collected from macrophytes, sediment and stones using a standard metal frame snail scoop and hand collection methods. Scarial emergence was done in the field by examining snails under light for 48 hours in 4 hour shifts. Molecular analysis is currently underway using the 28S, ITS and COX1 genes of secure trematodes and vector species to identify them to species level. A total of 910 aquatic snail vectors were collected and morphologically identified to belong to six different genus groups. These include Bulinus, collected at nine of the 16 sites, and Bionflavia, collected at four of the 16 sites. Four invasive species were collected during the survey. These include Bionflavia cablata, Vicella acuta, Sidiocinia communella, and Terribia granifera. Invasive species compete for the same niche as endemic species, and in most cases outcompete endemic vectors and the associated trematodes that are intermediate host specific. Sampled sites that had floating vegetation and algae had an overall higher number of taxa and number of individuals. Sites that had less floating vegetation was found to be less suitable for snail vector species. The water quality analysis also indicated that sites with high levels of phosphates and total hardness had lower snail vector species present. This indicates that water quality and habitat suitability is a determining factor in vector distribution. No scarial emergence was observed during the field examination. This can be due to lack of infection or parasitic infections may not be mature enough to facilitate the emergence of scarial trematodes. Mole molecular an analysis is expected to indicate a more accurate rate of infection among collected species. Thank you for your time and are there any questions? Thank you for your time and are there any questions? so much, Martin, for that talk. The next talk will be given by Feling Letlela, who is going to tell us about schistosomiasis, which I learned just after Googling five minutes ago, is the fancy word for bilharzia. Over to Feling. Good day, everyone. I am Feling Letlela, a first year master's student at the Northwest University. And today I will be telling you a bit about my project title, the historical and seasonal distribution of schistosomiasis transmitting vectors 
in the Mpumalanga province, South Africa. In South Africa, over 4 million people are infected with schistosomiasis annually, with children between the ages of 10 to 15 years and women having the highest prevalence to this disease. The Mpumalanga province is found in a tropical region, and this is where the intermediate host males are predominantly found. 70% of infections in the Mpumalanga province have been reported within Bombela and Gomazi local municipalities, which is why they were chosen as an area of interest for this study. This study aims to this study aims to understand the spatial and seasonal distribution of the schistosomiasis vector vectors Bulinus globosus and Bionfilaria fifleri in the Mpumalanga province over a period of 40 years. The data that was used was obtained from the National Freshwater Snail um, Freshwater Snail Collection, looking at the Bionfilaria fifleri and Bulinus globosus for a period of 40 years, from 1955 to 1995. The sample sites were digitized and mapped using Kriching interpolation or ordinary Kriching interpolation. This method classifies the ranges into a small number of classes and assigns colors to those classes, which was the sample size in this case. These are the preliminary maps that show the spatial distribution of the Fifleri and Globosus between the years 1955 to 1965 and 1986 to 1995 to show how the snail distribution changed over that time period. The red indicates very high snail count densities and the green indicates low snail count densi densities sorry and from these maps we can see that the snail distribution has shifted and greatly increased in both the Gomazi and Bombela municipalities with the highest risk areas being in Gomazi area up to the border with the Bombela municipality Seasonal distribution maps were created to see which seasons the snails preferred and spring was found to be the favored season in both the Bombela and Gomazi local municipalities with winter having less distribution due to dry conditions due to dry conditions spring has distribution that is widely spread on both municipalities with a high concentration situated around Bombela and a medium concentration around Gomazi. In conclusion, the snail distribution keeps on changing over the years with the season having a high influence on how the snails are distributed. The mapping of these snails and their historical distribution will assist government personnel in the development of control strategies at local municipalities which are currently not in place. Thank you so much for that talk, Filling. And next up we have Lomarie Janse van Rensburg, also a master's student, who is going to tell us about nutrient flows down the Kabompo River in Zambia. Over to Lomarie. Good day, my name is Lomarians van Rensburg and this is my master's project on using stable isotopes to trace nutrient flows down the Kabompa River of Zambia. So fresh water is some of the most threatened habitats in the world and has accrued more than 50% of all biodiversity losses, which are larger than terrestrial and marine losses combined. A loss in biodiversity might directly translate to loss in ecosystem services, which are crucial to meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, especially for food security and water security. The Upper Zambezi Basin landscape is the focal point of this thesis and specifically looks at the Kabompa River. 
Now this basin lies mostly within the remote northwestern province of Zambia and we, this thesis looks specifically at the Kabompo River that flows within it. The Kabompo is illustrated here in purple and stretches from the Congo-Zambia watershed across 440 kilometers approximately to the town of Lukulu. It is one of the most significant tributaries of the Upper Zambezi Basin and will be used as a proxy to try and illustrate ecological processes of the Upper Zambezi. A gap analysis with a systematic literature review indicated that food web information was the most extensive problem for river management in the Upper Zambezi Basin. As such, a food web analysis was decided on to try and pro uh, provide some of the first baseline information for ecological processes of the Upper Zambezi. These are representative sites from which fish and the putative sources were collected from the start in Munilunga, which is at the most northerly point on this map in the Kabompo, down to the town of Watopa, the green dot, to show how fish were collected. Mostly whole fish or fish fin clips were collected, as well as invertebrates and vegetation to account for full food webs. These were all identified to species or to any other level which was possible before being dried and sent to Pretoria where they were analysed using a mass spectrometer. Now we use stable isotope analysis to get a more three-dimensional view of how food webs could be functioning. Whereas the delta 50 nitrogen isotope value can show us the trophic position of an individual in a food web, the delta 13 carbon can show us where this nutrient comes from. This can then be used to construct full food webs and give us an idea of energy flow through a system. These are preliminary longitudinal comparisons between the averages of the isotope values of the herbivorous fish Labio cylindricus and the omnivorous fish Cynodontus. Both were caught at each sampling site with the Labio cylindricus species and the genus Cynodontus present throughout the system. The nutrient source and trophic position predictor isotopes were split apart and gra graphically illustrated across the sampling sites to better illustrate spatial change in feeding along the river, from the most northerly site Munilunga at position 1 to the most southerly position Watopa at position 6. For the nutrient source comparison, the labios are obligate algivores and feed within the expected isotope ranges, but unsurety still lies in why at sites 1, 2 and 6 the cynodontus does not free from nutrient sources of a more negative delta 13 carbon. In nutrient passage between fish, it's expected that fish from higher trophic positions would exhibit more of the heavier isotope delta 13 carbon than the lighter delta 12 carbon in ratios, providing a less negative delta 13 carbon value than their lower trophic position counterparts. And for the trophic position comparison, the fish follow what is typically expected from a trophic um, tropical fish food web, but uncertainty again arises from sites 4 as to why the fish are not separated by at least 2 per mil as is the norm between trophic positions. A possible explanation for this lies in the averaging of the fish isotope values. With further analysis we address these caveats and the nutrient contributions to the river from energy incorporation during fish feeding as a function of the landscape scale processes. We are looking at these three models, the river continuum concept, flood pulse concept and riverine productivity model as possible ways in which energy is incorporated into the Kabompa River. This is still an ongoing masters and I'd like to acknowledge the following people for their continued support. And I dedicate this thesis to my late professor and supervisor, Professor Olaf Weil. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lo Marie. I just would like to remind the audience to please send your questions through in the chat box. Many of our students are present in the room, so they can address them directly there, as I think we may not have time to take questions at the end. So the next speaker is Craig Rennie, and he is also going to tell us about the fish in the Kabumpo River. Over to Craig. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining for this brief presentation on the potential use of small fish species as indicators of anthropogenic change in the Kabumpo River. 
The Kobombo River is a large headwater tributary of the Upper Zambezi, located in northwestern Zambia. The Kobombo River system is fairly large, with an estimated catchment size of over 72,000 square kilometers. The river flows for over 700 kilometers from its source on the watershed divide between the Democratic Republic of Congo, all the way to its confluence with the Upper Zambezi, just above the Barotsi floodplains. The catchment's relatively untouched. However, there are two large copper nickel mines in the headwaters, and there's a large national park in the middle of the catchment, um, which is near where the present study took place. Just to give you an idea of what the system is like, there are large uh, floodplain type habitats which form essential habitat during the high water season for many fish species. But um, once these waters recede, fish are forced to return to the main channel, which is largely sandy bottom dominated. And they then rely on these marginal phragmite type habitats, your woody structure and your rocky riffles. However, the integrity of the Kobompo River system is under threat from various sources. These include deforestation for practices such as charcoal production, from large-scale mining operations, large dam projects for hydropower, as well as non-native species such as Nile tilapia and Australian red claw crayfish. Unfortunately, our ability to mitigate against the impacts of these anthropogenic threats is limited by a lack of knowledge and the concentration of studies in specific fisheries important areas. Therefore, as an attempt to try and fill a portion of this gap, the present study tried to um, look at species presence and identify microhabitat preferences of small fish communities to see if they could be used as indicators of anthropogenic change. As I previously mentioned, the study took place um, near the West Lunga National Park at its uh, southwestern end, where I sampled 14 reaches. And within each reach, I sampled small um, meso habitats. So I sampled five main meso habitat types, these being bare substrate, marginal phragmites, woody structure, rocky riffles, and valisneria patches using backpack electrofishing. And we had some sampling limitations due to the presence of crocodiles. So in total, we sampled 49 species, with the two here at the top being the most prominent. Here's just an example of some of the fish species that we, we sampled. And in total, we sampled over 2,300 individuals, and we only had seven sites where no fish species were recorded. So ultimately, what we found was that there are three main clusters. Um, the first group contained mainly enteromias and small cichlids, which were associated with phragmites and woody habitats. A second group associated with rocky habitats, which contained your characteristic um, rock-loving species. And then lastly, a rheophilic group uh, associated with increased current velocity. And then there were two species here at the bottom, which um, were more associated with Bellisneria and the bear habitats. When we look at the significance of these associations, we see that various species were significantly associated with the rocky habitat, several associated with Phragmites, some associated with both wood and Phragmites, and then four species associated with the woody, woody habitat, and a single species associated with both um, the Ballasneria and the bear habitat, respectively. If we look at other environmental variables, we see species were largely significantly associated with decreased current velocity. And we only had two species significantly associated with increased habitat depth. I just wanna quickly explain what the importance of data like this is using the rocky habitats as an example. So at the top here, we have the community under natural conditions, but under uh, increased sediment loading, we may see the decline in certain species significantly associated with rocky habitats while more generalist species may increase in abundance and some species may see no changes. So ultimately we found that there is um, potential for small fish species to be used as indicators of anthropogenic change. There's a need to preserve the present habitat mosaics and there's a need to try and determine um, fish communities along degradation gradients. So we can try to get an example of what fish communities look like in natural states versus um, altered states, and then just try and incorporate this into other um, environmental indicator studies that have already been con 
conducted in the system that used invertebrates, for example. I would just like to thank the following institutions and individuals for their help during the present study. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. We'll next hear from a PhD student, Tadiwa Mutizwa, who is also going to tell us, well, no, he they are going to tell us about the genus Hippopotamirus. Hope I got that right. Over to Tadiwa. Greetings to you all. My name is Tadiwa Mutizwa, and I'm here to share with you some of the work that I've been doing in the description of five new species from the genus Hippopotamirus within Southern Africa. This presentation is a follow-up on this publication on the diversity within the Hippopotamus and Soji species complex. My work centers around the family Momaile, which is a group of freshwater fishes endemic to Africa. This family is well known for its high diversity, as well as its unique ability to produce electric organ discharges. These electric organ discharges are used for communication as well as exploring their environment. In particular, this study examined the diversity within the genus Hippopotamus, which is one of the eight Momari genera found within Southern Africa. What makes this genus particularly interesting is the fact that the three Southern African species are not monophyletic with the rest of the species found within the rest of Africa. Specifically, the three Southern African species do not form a monophyletic group with the type species of this genus Hippopotamus castor which is found within West Africa. Hippopotamus and Soji was described in 1905 based on specimens collected in Angola. For a long time, this species was thought to have a wide disjunct distribution searching across multiple river systems from the Kunene River to the Buzi River system. However, subsequent studies recognized that Hippopotamus and Soji was a species complex and were able to describe new species which include Hippopotamus saboy and Hippopotamus longilateralis. The studies that identified Hippopotamus saboy and Hippopotamus longilateralis recognized that there was possibly more hidden diversity within the Hippopotamus and Soji species complex. This has been recently confirmed by genetic studies on this same species complex. However, to date, there are only three species that are recognized from the Hippopotamus and Soji species complex. One of the impediments to the description of new species from the Hippopotamus and Soji species complex was the lack of a clear type locality for this species. However, our recent synthesis of literature on the collections by Dr. Ansoji suggests that the Kwanzaa River system is the most probable type locality for Hippopotamus and Soji. The aim of this study was to integrate molecular and morphological evidence to describe five new species from the Hippopotamus and Soji species complex. Molecular methods based on three genetic markers were integrated with traditional morphometric measurements and nine meristic counts. Phylogenetic reconstruction based on specimens collected across the entire range of Hippopotamus and Soji showed that it formed one well-supported monophyletic group. This monophyletic group was further split into 12 molecular taxonomic units. The diversity between molecular taxonomic units ranged between 1.5 to 9 percent, whilst divergence within molecular taxonomic units ranged between 0.2 to 1.7 percent. Each of the molecular taxonomic units was only found within one river system. By combining molecular and morphological evidence, we were able to describe five new species. These new species were distinguished by a number of scale and fin ray counts. These included a species from the Kwanzaa, Okavango, Luo, Pungwe, and Buzi river systems. In conclusion, our study identified five new species from the Hippopotamus and Soji species complex. Additionally, there were some lineages that were identified in this study but were not described as new species. This was due to them either having a low number of specimens or associations with currently valid species. 
Finally, Hippopotamus and Soji is considered to be of least concern due to its widespread distribution. However, our study suggests that some of the new species have limited ranges and their conservation statuses may need to be revised. I would like to thank the various institutes that provided funding and technical support to make this project possible. I'd also like to thank my supervisors as well as my colleagues for the support during this project. Thank you. Thank you, Tadiwa. And we will next hear from another PhD student, Yonela Sitole. And I'm definitely not going to try to pronounce the species name in her title. So we'll hear from her. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm Yonela Sitole, a PhD student. Today, I will be presenting on a new paracanoglani species from the Migo Congo Basin in the Jar Forest Reserve. The catfish genus paracanoglani is distributed over the central part of the African continent in five Ethiopian provinces. Paracanoglani is comprised of 10 species, of which five of these species occur in the Congo Basin. A recent detailed study of paracanoglani species conducted in the Congo Basin and adjacent basins in Southern Africa. Hi everyone, I'm Tembani and I'll be presenting in the Jar Forest Reserve. Paracanoglani species from the Migo Congo Basin in the Jar Forest Reserve. The catfish genus Paracanoglani is distributed over the central part of the African continent in five Ethiopian provinces. Paracanoglani is comprised of 10 species, of which five of these species occur in the Congo Basin. A recent detailed study of Paracanoglani species conducted in the Congo Basin and adjacent basins in Southern Africa revealed a presence of possible undescribed species from the Jar River, a tributary of the Congo Basin. This study provides morphological evidence to show that these specimens are indeed a new species to science. And for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be referring to these specimens as Parakinoglanis jar. In comparison of Parakinoglanis jar to other Parakinoglanis populations or species in the Congo Basin, preliminary results show that Parakinoglanis jar is differentiated from these species or populations by unique combination of color pattern, the shape of the humeral process, morphometric characters, and also different distributions. Although specimens of Parakinoglanus jar were collected from the Jar River, a tributary of the Congo Basin, they were previously misidentified and labeled as Parakinoglanus pandarinas, a lower Guinea species that is considered to be endemic to the Ntem River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean. Results show that Parakinoglanus jar is differentiated from Parakinoglanus pandarinus by spots forming seven to eight vertical rows on the flanks and head with faint or without spots, while Parakinoglanus pandarinus has unarranged spots on the flanks and a heavily spotted head. These two were also distinguished by several morphometry characters, such as the size of the head. Parakinoglanus jar was also compared to other Parakinoglanus species occurring in the Lower Guinea based on data obtained from their original descriptions and other key references. Parakinoglanus jar is differentiated from this species mainly by color pattern and morphometric characters. It was further compared to another Parakinoglanus species co occurring in the Jar River, Parakinoglanus altipinis. The body spots of Parakinoglanus jar are arranged vertically, while in Parakinoglanus altipinis, the spots are arranged horizontally. These two were further differentiated by a couple of morphometric characters, such as the size of dorsal fin and pre-dorsal length. Based on these results, Parakinoglanus jar is currently under description as a new species for science. In this study, a new Parakinoglanus species from the jar in the Congo Basin was described. The description of this new species from specimens that were collected more than 25 years ago highlights the relevance of existing collections in discovering hidden species diversity. Therefore, 
Taxonomic studies on available specimens in our fish collections are encouraged. Secondly, the discovery of a new medium-sized fish species endemic to the Jaffa Forest Reserve shows the lack of information on freshwater fish species diversity in numerous protected areas in the Como Basin. And Thank you so much, Yonela. Next, we'll be hearing from a master's student who is doing work on something more familiar to me. Uh, we'll be hearing from Tembani Mkize, who's going to tell us about the coastal vegetated habitats of Algoa Bay. Over to Tembani. Hi, everyone. I'm Tembani, and I'll be presenting the results from one of my MSc chapters. Fish nursery habitats are known to have high abundances and species, and species richness of juvenile fish. They contribute to high growth and survival rate through food provision and protection from predators. Structurally complex habitats such as seagrass, mangroves, coral reefs, and other macroalgae are particularly important as fish nursery areas. In South Africa, studies have mostly focused on estuary nursery habitats, which are seagrasses, and very likely have been done on the near shore marine malcoalgae habitat, which are potential fish nursery areas. The aim of this study is to assess the necessary role of seagrass and macroalgae for juvenile fish in the Alcoa Bay shallow water seascape. The objective of this study is to assess habitat connectivity and habitat use by juvenile fish using ministerial rafts. Both seagrass and macroalgae are structurally complex habitats. Therefore, it is hypothesized that they will perform the same necessary function. This study was conducted in sweat corps and flat rocks. Three seagrass sites were identified in the lower reaches of sweat corps, and three macroalgae sampling sites were identified in flat rocks. Calibrated ministerial rough systems were used to sample fish in both habitats. In macroalgae, the systems were deployed in low tide, while in seagrass, the deployment was during high tide. Systems were left to record for 60 minutes undisturbed. Collected videos were analyzed using event measure and relative abundance as well as number of species were recorded. Total length measurements of fish appearing in both cameras were taken using CGIS stereo. Fish behavior was analyzed using Boris software and data was analyzed using Primer and Statistica. A total of 24 species were recorded in both habitats combined. Six species were common between the two habitats, 12 species were only recorded in macroalgae, while five species were only recorded in seagrass. There was no significant difference in mean fish relative abundance between the two habitats, but it was slightly higher on seagrass compared to macroalgae. Macroalgae had significantly higher number of species compared to seagrass habitat. For species common in both habitats, a relative abundance of mallets and cliff fish was not significant different. A relative abundance of black tail, zebra fish, and a strapi was significantly higher in macroalgae habitat compared to seagrass habitat. Relative abundance of cave stump nose was significantly higher in seagrass habitat. In terms of fish size, mean total length was not significantly different between the two habitats, but it was slightly higher on macroalgae compared to seagrass. Both habitats were dominated by juvenile fish as over 70% of recorded fish from both habitats were juveniles. Juvenile fish assemblages differed significantly between macroalgae and seagrass, but there were no differences between sites within each habitat.
these are species that contributed the most to dissimilarities between the two habitats. In terms of behavior, there were no significant differences in all behavioral categories between the two habitats. But feeding was visibly higher in macroalgae than in seagrass. Please note that feeding and slow mindering show high degree of habitat use. Findings of this study show that these two structurally complex habitats are important necessary habitats for fish. And juvenile fish use these two habitats more or less the same way. Therefore, our hypothesis was accepted. Thank you so much for listening. So much for that marine perspective, Timbani. We will now hear from another master's student, Michle Gaiza, who will tell us about macroalgal reef nurseries in Algoa Bay. Good day, everyone. My name is Michle Gaiza, and I'll be presenting my master's research titled Necessary Provision of Macroalgal Reefs in a Coastal Seascape in Algoa Bay. I am supervised by Dr. Nicola James, Dr. Paul Pierstein, and Dr. Anthony Bennett. Coastal marine and estuarine ecosystems are highly productive and serve an important necessary function for coastal fish species. Most research into the necessary function of coastal ecosystem has been focused on the estuarine environment, particularly in South Africa. The value of estuarine as necessaries has been attributed to the provision of structural complex habitats such as seagrass, mangrove, and salt marsh, which results in an increased survival of fish and invertebrate species through protection from predators, and also the provision of substrate for food to grow on. In the absence of seagrass meadows and mangroves, other structural complex habitats in the near shore may provide important necessary areas for juvenile fish in temperate near shore areas, particularly in sheltered bays where wave action is reduced. Less attention has focused on the relationship between structural complexity and necessary provision for coastal fishes in the near shore marine environment in South Africa. Gratwicker and and SPY 2005 applied a habitat assessment score to gauge habitat complexity across several different shallow marine habitats, including sandy patches, algal beds, seagrass, and reefs in tropical bays in the Caribbean. Habitat complexity closely, closely mirrored fish species richness with greater species richness recorded in more complex habitats. Similarly, in the Mediterranean, Kamini ETL 2017 found a higher diversity of juvenile fish in macro algal forest with a high level of structural complexity compared with less complex macroalgae habitats. The aim of this project is to assess and map habitat complexity and macroalgae as well as fish assemblages, which include diversity, abundance, behavior, and size structure across three different habitat patches in a shallow sheltered rock cove in the western sector of Algoa Bay. The main objective is to assess the necessary function of habitat patches of of differing complexity within the cove for juvenile fish species. The study site for this research is a rocky cove called Flat, Flat Rocks in Algoa Bay in Kabeja. The three habitat types that are found within the study site are Sandy Patches, Laurentia Reef, Procamium Reef, and within these three habitat patches we we quantified complexity using one by one meter quadrants and came up with a habitat assessment score using the methods of Gratwicka and Spike 2005. And we also used a chain and a ball method. In order to assess the fish assemblages within each habitat patch, we used stereo rafts. I measured complexity using the habitat assessment score. The sand patch are the least rugose and the Procamium reef have the most rugosity. Preliminary results show that species richness increases with higher complexity. To study the fish assemblage composition, stereo rafts were deployed approximately 30 centimeters away from, from selected sites during low tides. All sites ranged not deeper than 5 meters and were classified by the presence of macroalgae as well as in some sites 
the presence of Sandy Reese. The sampling method was standardized to 60 minutes per, per footage. Footages from the stereo rows were analyzed using event measure, where relative abundance of a species was measured using Maxen. At Maxen, individuals were identified to the lowest taxonomy level possible. Behavioral Observation Research Interface Software, also known as BORIS, was also used to analyze the behavior of individual species at Maxen. I am currently analyzing the data that I have collected this far, and hopefully in my next presentation I will be presenting my findings. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening and if you do have questions please do ask. Thank you so much Michle. So just before we um, listen to the last talk for the session I just would like to remind everyone about the poll for the presentations um, which I hear will actually be held in the main room and not here in the breakout room. So if you could please return to the main room at the end of this session to vote for the best presentation. That would be great just before you go off for tea. So we will now hear our last speaker for the day is Aidan Jacobs. He's a master's student and I've heard that he submitted his thesis today. So congratulations to him. Over to Aidan. Good day. My name is Aidan Jacobs and today I'll be presenting my MSc dissertation entitled Shallow Water Seascape Connectivity, Prey Resources and Food Web Dynamics of Juvenile Spirit Fishes in a Shallow Subtitle Reef in Algoa Bay, South Africa. Nursery habitats are those in which juvenile growth, density, survival and movement to adult populations are greater than other habitats. Global change in habitat destruction by anthropogenic activities are threatening nursery habitats it is therefore imperative that the nursery function of all coastal habitats is understood so that they may be holistically conserved to ensure the sustainability of all fish populations. Recent research suggests that shallow subtidal macroalgal reefs may serve as important fish nurseries. In Australia, juvenile fishers utilize subtidal macroalgal reefs before recruiting as adults to nearby coral reefs. Little is known about the value and functioning of these in Algoa Bay and information on food resources and foraging by juvenile fishers is lacking. Flat Rocks comprises the subtidal macroalgal reef located off the eastern shore of the Cape Recife Peninsula of Algoa Bay. It is dominated by Plocamium carillariza, Amphiroa ephedrae, and Laurentia natalensis, and juvenile sparrows Diplodus capensis and Sarpa sarpa are abundant. They also utilize other nurseries within the seascape. Diplodus capensis or blacktail are abundant as larvae in surf zones in Algoa Bay until they recruit as zero plus juveniles to nurseries within the Algoa Bay seascape. Sarpa sulpa or striopi spawn in KZN and larvae drift to the eastern and western cape where they recruit into nurseries within the Algoa Bay seascape. Therefore, the aim of the study is to assess food resources available to juvenile sparrowed fishes and investigate the trophic ecology of these juveniles within the shallow subtitle zone at Flat Rocks. To do this, two objectives were met to quantify the abundance and biomass of food resources available to juvenile sparrows and to investigate the trophic ecology of juvenile sparrowed fishes. Shallow subtitle reefs are highly productive coastal ecosystems that provide prey to juvenile fishes. To assess food resources available to juvenile sparrowed fishes, four objectives were met. Quantification of macroalgal biomass, epiphytic biomass, invertebrate abundance, and benthic invertebrate abundance. To do this, sampling was conducted at spring low tide from February to April in 2021, during the peak juvenile recruitment period into flat rocks. Dominant macroalgae was collected in 20 by 20 centimeter quadrats, while sediment was collected using a Van Veen grab sampler. The macroalgal samples were then placed in a sonicating bath to remove epiphytes, which were then filtered out of the sample. The chlorophyll in the epiphyte samples were then analyzed using a 10 AU fluorometer. Invertebrates were then removed from the macroalgal samples using a sorting tray, and the macroalgal biomass was then quantified, and the macroinvertebrate abundance and biomass were quantified. The epiphyte biomass significantly differed between months, while the macroalgal biomass did not differ significantly between months. 
macro invertebrate abundance and biomass differed significantly between substrates but not between months and polychaete abundance and biomass differed significantly between substrates. These results suggest that macroalgal growth is limited by surface epiphytes and herbivory, while epiphyte biomass fluctuates with environmental conditions. Amphipods were present in all substrates but associated with Laurentia, isopods did not associate with Amphiroa, and polychaetes associated with Amphiroa and sediment. The role of life history strategy and predation refuge are important for macro of invertebrate association. Trophic ecology investigates the energy pathways between organisms in an ecosystem. To investigate the trophic ecology of juvenile spirit fishes within the shallow subtidal reef at Flat Rocks, three objectives were met, the gut content analysis of model species, and the analysis of the stable isotope composition of the prey resources and the model species, with a null hypothesis that the model species stable isotope composition is reflective of prey resources within the reef. The prey resources were collected as in Chapter 1, and 10 blacktail and strepi juveniles were captured during each month of sampling. Each individual's gut content was analysed, and the stable isotope composition of the model species and prey resources was conducted. Gut content analysis revealed that blacktail were feeding on polychaetes, epiphytes, and other unidentifiable macroalgae and invertebrates, and amphipods declined in their gut with size, and strepi were feeding on polychaetes, epiphytes, and Laurentia and amphiroa. Results from the stable isotope analysis revealed that blacktail were feeding predominantly on Amphiroa and Striopi were feeding on polychaetes as well as Amphiroa. Polychaetes lessened and Amphiroa and Laurentia increased in dietary proportions with Striopi size. Early stage ontogenetic diet shifting is suggested by the differences in gut content for blacktail between size classes and the results from the stable isotope analysis for the striopi between size classes. Differences in the gut content analysis and stable isotope analysis between blacktail and striopi suggest that they are resource partitioning at flat rocks. The null hypothesis is also rejected because the stable isotope composition of the juvenile fish does not reflect the resources present at flat rocks. In conclusion, this study provides the first assessment of prey resources at flat rocks and the first account of sparrowed resource utilization at flat rocks during their early stages. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan, and congratulations again for submitting your thesis. So on my watch, it's three minutes past 11, meaning we could have time for one really quick question. If you'd like to raise your hand. Otherwise, I know there's been one question from Pedro in the chat box, but if anyone would like to ask a live question, please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any hands. So um, if Tadiwa is available, would you like to answer Pedro's question in the chat? Tadiwa, are you there? Hello. I, Hi. Yeah. So Tadiwa, Pedro's question was um, from the identified putative species. Some species will not be described. Further research is needed. Why are these species not going to be described now? Hello, Carla. Sorry, I was just getting uh, sorted up. Okay, so Pedro, the, the reason why we didn't uh, describe uh, some of these, can you hear me? Yes, we can. The reason why we didn't uh, describe uh, some of the lineages that described this, there were four of them actually, was that uh, one of them was in the upper Zambezi and we only had like two voucher specimens. So uh, at the moment that didn't feel like enough uh, information. So. We, we hopefully will get more specimens so that we can actually make a, a more informed decision on that particular lineage. Then the other three were from the Kwanzaa River system. And as I mentioned, they are already, from the morphological data that I, I collected, I, I measured, they look very similar to currently valid species. But uh, we didn't have any genetic information from the types type species of these valid, valid species. So, we wanted to avoid the situation where we describe something that's already described. 
But uh, I can confirm that there is already work that's uh, looking at these uh, different, these, 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 these lineages and the uh, valid species in the Kwanzaa River. I mean, there's a lot of work going around Momaris within the Kwanzaa River system. And this is one of the aspects that they're looking at, uh, just trying to link some of the species that were described way back without uh, genetic information to the new collections that we've made. So it, it is something that will be clarified in the a, in a, in future. Just, that is actually being clarified in, in current research and will be published soon. Great. Thank you so much, Tadiwa, for that answer. So we have run out of time and the session is going to end. Thank you so much to our attendees for joining the session. And please do return to the main room so that you can vote for the best presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.